Hi, I'm Hayley Victoria and welcome back to my Crime and Policing channel. In today's session, we're going to be looking further into our forensic science investigations and one area we've not really covered, which is huge, is... Now this takes a, takes a lot of saying, I need to get myself prepared for it. <laughs> Deoxyribonucleic acid. So, what's that? Some people might ask. That is DNA. And it's much easier to say DNA than it is deoxyribonucleic acid when you wear a brace and you have a northern accent like I do. So looking at DNA is huge in terms of crime scene investigation. I mean that stuff turns up everywhere. Like if it comes off or out of you, there's a high, high, high chance it's got your DNA all over it and you are a unique little rainbow. You know, you're the only person that has that exact same makeup unless you're an identical twin. So, if you have got an identical twin and you fancy committing some crimes, you can blame it on your sibling. And that has happened before, but please don't. So let's have a think about where we can find DNA from us then. It comes from your hair follicles, it comes out of blood, saliva, sweat, semen, seminal fluids, vaginal fluids, pee, poo, earwax, pus, mucus. Uh, and obviously like, you know, you, stuff inside you like your organs your muscles that kind of stuff basically like i said if it comes off you or out of you it's probably covered all in your genetic makeups so that we can find out where you've been i told you every contact leaves a trace right so let's think about where that might be in a crime scene um if you're looking at saliva and stuff you might be analyzing bite marks or like backwash out of drinks and things like that on cigarette butts, on things you've had in your mouth, obviously. Uh, what else we've got? Well, we've got your hair follicles, where you get that information from. So your hair, that gets transferred. Um, we did the trace evidence thing between person and person. Remember the primary transfer is if I had a struggle um, with you, for example, I don't know who you are. I'm sorry, I, I don't like fighting, but we're having a fight for this example. And in this struggle, um, you get my hair on you. That's a primary transfer. If you then go and sit on your sofa at your nanan's house, grandma, granny, whatever you call it, where you're from, then that sofa gets that hair on it, that's a secondary transfer, and so on. Um, obviously bodily fluids in relation to semen and seminal fluid are generally found inside uh, sexual assault victims or in their underwear, on their clothes, on the suspect's clothes as well, depending on what's happened um, on the body. Blood can be found anywhere, as we've discussed, and that stuff gets everywhere. Uh, yeah, so it can be really found anywhere. Samples have been taken from, like I said, cigarette butts, remember the Capel murders, um, toothbrushes, fingernail scrapings, cups, anything. And it's really important that they, they all get checked out, and they do. A good crime scene investigator will leave no stone unturned, and remember that golden hour principle, that the best evidence is that short window of time directly after the crime is being committed. Because over, over time, evidence does deteriorate and that's just natural, especially if it's outside. So it's important for investigators to gather that evidence, photograph it in situ, gather it all before it gets contaminated or corrupted. Okay, back on the DNA thing. It was only in 1984, and some people might be like, maybe that was 100 years ago, but 1984, it doesn't seem that long ago to me. If we look at the grand scheme of things in relation to forensic science, I mean, 1247, when Song Si's writing all about like, you know, forensic entomology and crime scene investigation and pathology and stuff, that's 1247. 1984 is a big jump. It's, it's still before I was born, just to clear that up, just. But, you know, that was, that was a long time ago to some, but to me, I think that's fairly recent in terms of forensic developments. It was thanks to Dr. Alec Jeffries and co, there's a few of them who worked on it at the time, but um, Dr. Jeffries was kind of like the main dude who figured all this out, was the person who really hit the nail in the case coffin for DNA profiling and DNA fingerprinting, as you might also hear it called. And it was like this massive moment in forensic science. Because, you know, blood types could have, you could figure out if someone was type A or type B and things like that. But now we've got the whole genetic codes. And like I mentioned, you guys are unique. They don't, you don't get two of you. And say, you know, unless you're a twin. But you know, take that. You're very unique. In whatever things you do in life, there's only one of you. 
But that came a cropper for one particular person. And um, there were some horrific crimes committed by this person. And he was convicted of rape and murder of two young girls back in the 1980s. And that's Colin Pitchfork. So back in the 1980s, it wasn't uncommon for teenage girls to babysit. And, you know, in the areas in Britain were, were all right. You could leave your doors open. You could wander down to the streets to your friend's house. I mean, I was doing that in the 90s. I was walking ages to get to my friend's house. And then I felt totally safe. Um, I used to babysit and stuff. But for my siblings, sibling, hi, Rue. Um, yeah, so back in those days, it was quite common for teenagers to babysit for in the community. It's quite common for you to walk to your friend's houses and stuff like that. That was just kind of the norm it, it was just how it was and in this nice little town little area is where these victims are from so the first victim is linda mann she was 15 years old and walking home from a babysitting job when she was approached by a stranger in a car with his, his baby son in the car and he was asking for directions and i think probably I don't, maybe seeing the baby she might have felt a little bit more like you know comfortable thinking okay so he's got a kid he's just lost and she tried to help him out by giving him directions, but before anything else could happen, he um, apprehended her. He, he obviously, uh, seriously, seriously sexually assaulted her, raped her, and he strangled her with her own scarf and left her there in a place called the Black Pad, which is like a little wooded area um, local to where they live. And she would never have normally walked that way. She was taking a shortcut home. That one time she walked down there, and obviously that awful, awful thing happened. So... That was the first crime and investigators at the time took a, a semen sample from Linda and they discovered that the profile of this person was very quite unique. It only matched 10% of the male population of Britain and the blood type was type A. So they found that out from this scene. That's all they had at that moment. So it was kind of parked. It was obviously ongoing. I'm just going to forget about it. It's a serious offence, but they didn't really know what to do with it. So it was a couple of years later when... Um, Another victim, Dawn Ashworth, also 15, went missing. So she went to a friend's house. She was due home by 9.30pm and her parents were expecting her home but she never turned up. And obviously they were extremely worried about her because that's totally uncharacteristic. She wouldn't, she's not the kind of girl who doesn't come home. But she didn't. So the police were called and two days later they found Dawn. And the MO was very similar to Linda, to when she died. So MO is your modus operandi, and that's kind of like your characteristics as a criminal. So there's, there's all, well, there's criminal characteristics and there's MO. Your MO is kind of the way in which you do it. So it might be that, um, when we look at the, uh, what's it called now? Jack the Ripper. There was a certain way in which he committed all of his crimes and how he left the crime scene. That's your MO, the same kind of thing. They knew this is, this, this is the same, this is too uncanny to not be the same guy. So they took some samples from, from Dawn from the scene and they found the same profile, type A blood, same genetic profile. And then at the time, um, there were police officers looking for Dawn when she was missing. And 17-year-old Richard Buckland, um, he got learning difficulties and he was like talking up to the police officers and he was like, so um, well, what are you doing? What did you do? And he's like, oh, well, we're in the middle of an investigation, please just go away, you know, we're busy. Um, Mr. Member of the Public, just let us do our job. And um, Richard was quite interested in what was happening. And that's just how he was, he was very interested in things. But he was like, are you looking in the wrong place? She's over there. And so they were like, oh, okay, so you're very interested in this. You're at the crime scene all the time, you're floating about. And now you think you know where this person is and nobody else does. That's a bit suspicious, Richard. So they locked him up, they arrested Richard on suspicion of um, you know raping and murdering these girls and through intense questioning i mean he's a vulnerable adult is um richard is a vulnerable person because he has got learning difficulties and stuff and they questioned him now from looking at what uh, richard has said if you look at any of the old um tv interviews and stuff after that he felt very oppressed in those interviews and forced to give these confessions and he confessed to knowing about what had happened to Linda. Not Linda, sorry, to Dawn. But he said he had no idea about the first one. No idea, but he knew what had happened 
to dawn. So whether or not he'd seen something, I don't know. But, um, well, they arrested him. But they took a sample from him. Thank God. <laughs> they took a sample from Richard. And there was absolutely no way he could have been responsible for those crimes. So thanks to Dr. Alec Jeffries, Richard Buckland was free. Because his blood type was nothing like the one that was at the scene. And that 10% unique profile that was, wasn't Richard's. So this started a nationwide manhunt, right, for somebody with a matching profile. So all around the, like, the area, they got every adult male um, to come and take a blood test. So they called everybody in to take blood tests to find this DNA sample. Most people did, but there was one person who really wasn't keen to have a blood test, and that was Colin Pitchfork. And um, he made a bit of a big stink about it at work. And he was a baker at the time. And even at home, he was like, oh, I don't want to do it. I don't see why they're making us all do it. It's not fair. And at work, he was like, oh, I don't want to do it. And they're like, mate, it takes a couple of minutes. You hardly feel it. Go and do it. You know, we want our streets to be safe, right? And he went on for ages. And he's avoiding it like the plague. And then he was starting to ask people at work to take it for him. And he was like, oh... Yeah, you know, well, what happened was, right, I've already taken the test. I took it for my friend, and he's a bit of a dodgy character. He was arrested for flashing years ago, and he didn't want, you know, people to find out, so I took a test for him, and could you take one for me, please? Well, actually, Colin Pitchfork had been done for flashing before. Decent exposure. Flashing, that I appreciate might be a very British term. Um, Colin Pitchfork had been done for flashing before for decent exposure. So he's kind of telling the story of him, but making it his friend. My friend is a flasher. So after a long time of badgering co-workers, there was one co-worker who finally agreed to do it. And they were like, really manipulated by Colin Pitchfork. It's not something that had they known what he'd done, they wouldn't have done it, obviously. And they didn't really see the big deal. They thought, you know, I felt sorry for this guy, I was helping him out. And um, they actually forged a passport to have the test taken. You need to prove that it was you. And the police tried to, you know, intercept that kind of thinking and to not let it happen. So Pitchfork and a co-worker, I'm not going to name because it's not fair, went to have a photograph taken in one of those picture booths, you know, like at train stations. And Pitchfork actually doctored his own passport very cleverly and put the picture of his workmate in there. So he was like a master baker. He, he was like, um, he used to do really decorative cakes and stuff. So his attention to detail was very good. So he um, forged his passport. His friend went for the blood test. And then that, he didn't really think anything of it. Um, they were in the pub. So not Colin. He didn't go back to work, actually, for a while. Um, the, the workmate didn't go back for a while. But Colin was at work um, and like bragging off, saying like, oh yeah, I took the test, took the test. Yeah, all done. <laughs> Ooh, what a big deal of a nothing. <laughs> Silly me. Um, and then after a few months, the workmate and colleagues, not Colin, went to the pub. And they were all there, like, chatting, as you do. And someone mentioned about Colin Pitchfork, um, just in conversation. And someone was like, oh, I do not like him. He's such a perv. Like, the ladies in the group were saying, you know, he's so handsy. He always chats us up. In, he, he's actually a bit creepy. He creeps me out a little bit. And someone was like, oh, yeah. It was really funny about taking that blood test. Because the investigation was still ongoing at this point. And the workmate who took the test for him said, well, I took that test for him. Alarm bells were ringing, right? These girls are thinking, this guy's a definite perv. The workmates were all going about how weird it was he didn't want to take this test and how he kept asking others to take it for him. And then one of their teams says, oh, yeah, I took it for him, yeah. Uh-oh. Well, shortly after at work, one of these people are at work with him and it just does not sit right. Something that Pitchfork says to this colleague just gives her the creeps and she phones the police. Well done. <laughs> so she phoned the police with her suspicions and obviously they, you know, they, they sort it out, they arrest him and everything like that. And he gets sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of I think about 30 years. He's out by the way now, he was released in September. But yeah, he was found guilty, his DNA matched and um, that unique genetic profile. How amazing is that? So if it wasn't for Dr. Alec Jeffries, Pitchfork would never have been um, found to be that person. And poor Richard Buckland would probably be serving the time in prison for that false confession he gave under duress. It just goes to prove that 
the forensic techniques that we are um, creating, analysing and making better just continue to happen over time. And it still does now. So even in, uh, back in the year 2000, we started doing computer generated stuff like that, which for some people still seems like a mile away. But to me, that's very recent. Yeah, so that's DNA profiling. What we're going to do soon is I'll actually go through the steps of how to do that. But there are so many tests. We'll be here for a long time. So yeah, for today, just remember where DNA can be found, where it comes from on you, and how great it is at proving people's guilt and exonerating those who are innocent. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about police interview techniques a different time and confessions, but that's it for today. Stay safe, don't commit any crimes, and yeah, see you later.